Hey guys, and welcome back to another AMC Versus. I'm your host for today, Amy Rose Eisenbach, and we have a very exciting topic to debate and deliberate today. And before we get into that, I'm going to introduce the wonderful panelists I have sitting here with me. To my left, I have the writer, director, good friend of AMC's, John Schnepp. Uh, today we're doing Orm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. That's what we're doing. I'm Batman. Also to my right, I have the lovely Maud Garrett. Hi there, I'm gonna go with Bane today. Yeah. We're going to discuss Batman. <laughs> Not bad. And Not the bad. pressure is on for my last <laughs> panelist, Mr. Dennison. Where's the trigger? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. Well, we're actually not talking about Batman at all today. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, the conversation today will be about who has been more influential for comic book films, Mr. Tim Burton versus Christopher Nolan. Very, very exciting. Both incredible filmmakers, so both very influential. And uh, let's go ahead and start with you, Dennis. Why don't we talk about the pros of Tim Burton being more influential? Well, with Tim Burton, the, the, with the original Batman that he made, at that time, there was just no, no comic book movies out. I mean, we had Superman before, but like they were just so sparsely released. And, and, and what Tim Burton's Batman did was not just for the fans, but for the studios, let them know, OK, we can take these comic book properties and make them into big franchises that we can make a lot of money on through not just the, the movie ticket sales, but merchandise as well, kind of like the Star Wars model. Because before that, even when, you know, with Superman, it, it, you know, those old movies were hits, but they weren't, they weren't quite the franchise making, money making products that, that Batman was. Because I remember when Batman came out, it was like everyone, including myself, was like, I want everything Batman. I want Batman t shirts, I want Batman this, blah, 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 Joker that, Joker this. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it opened up that door for the studios to say, hey, we can take a risk on this. Let's, let's put some money in this. Let's, let's get you know, actually good talent, good actors, and, and get them behind a property like this. And then, and then that way we can, we can kind of carry this on through down the line. Mm -hmm. Maude, what about you for in pro of Tim Burton? I, I agree. He was like the pioneer of the comic book adaptation and he did it in such a beautiful gothic operatic way where you know, the city of Gotham was believable and he did such a good job, or I should say Anton first did a really good job and he got Academy nods for you know, his interpretation of Gotham, which was this mythical place that you'd only read about if you were a comic book fan, but for the first time it became this mainstream door into what Batman really was. And I think that Michael Keaton did a great job but playing Batman. I don't think he was the better Bruce Wayne, mm -hmm. but I think he did a, a great Batman and having Jack Nicholson as the Joker. And it was like this haunting juxtaposition between the guy who loves to laugh and someone who, you know, he killed people laughing. People would die from laughing. Mm -hmm. And that is like the most terrifying thing. Like that is haunting. And it came out in 89 and I was a little bit young, like when that first happened. So I watched it a little bit after. But having this you know, that smile, and Jack Nicholson, only he could kind of do that. That's not the parody of it all, but it was like, it was so scary and so serious in such a comical way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, you know, anyone had really done that. So he, he was on the map for that. Burton's on the map. This is in Burton's time where he was started to become on a roll. This is mm -hmm. when he was hot, you know. Afterwards, he did Edward Scissorhands, and then he got um, Batman Returns in there as well. Um, but I think that it, it was a risk. Burton has this like really elaborate, crazy flair, but in the first movie with Batman 89, it was such a Batman movie mm -hmm. and it was great. The Batmobile, the whole part of it, nailed it, I felt. And then when he got creative control with Batman Returns, it was like, you know, like I said, it's just like this Gotham opera, mm -hmm. really, but it worked in such a way where it could have flopped, it could have been horrible and cheesy, but it worked. Yeah, absolutely. The kind of talent that he, I think you nailed it with the franchise discussion because sure, we had Christopher Reeve, we had a lot of amazing films before this showing some of our favorite comic book heroes, characters and all that, but he created that universe that we hadn't really seen before and it actually felt like you were in a comic book. It was so whimsical and crazy and outrageous and I think that's what he did because this was Burton at his best. Like Burton's always that 
quirky kind of characters and like just vibe is seen in a lot of films that don't work. But with Gotham, it was perfect. Mm. And the kind of just talent that he kept attracting. I never remember when Michael Keaton, well, like, I too was young, but I remember the backlash after I was involved in this world and how people were like, eh, he wouldn't be good. And then he was great. And it kind of just further catapulted his career as well. And I think just seeing it on screen in the Burton world made it tangible for the first time. And I mean, that was really the platform of where all the other, you know, Batman films to date, or at least in that universe kind of launched. Um, and just the character that we've seen it reincarnated in different actors, mm. like he gave that platform, he set the stage for that. So, I mean, it's undeniable how influential his, you know, just vision has been what your particular flavor and taste is, that's debatable, obviously. But uh, he definitely kind of set the stage and kind of attracted non-comic book fans to comic book property as well, um, which I don't think, you know, was done before. Christopher Reeve, of course, too, and all the other incarnations attracted to our parents and all of that, but this was like, hey, even if you're not a nerd, this is a really cool, dark, gritty world that you would probably want to be a part of. Right. I think <clears throat> in, in 1988 and going into 89 when they released the film, they created this hype about Batman with just that bat symbol. It was, it was everywhere. You couldn't escape it, and people were like shaving it into the back of their heads. They didn't even know who Batman was. They were like, I just love Batman. It was that kind of thing, a crossover. Me being a comic book nerd at the time, like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, had come out a few years before. And then there was year one, and there was this whole uh, like renaissance period for comic book readers of the time. Was, I was a teenager at the time, but it was like, for me, it was like the, my, my, I still look at it as like a golden age where it was like, comic book characters had grown up with us and we were seeing like adult stories as opposed to just like, I'm fighting Moon Man or whatever. <laughs> yeah. They were dealing with things and issues that you like you were dealing with as a kid, mm -hmm. as a young adult. So you could, you, you could relate to these characters. W wasn't seeing it in the early the Adam West Batmans or any of the superhero, the tryouts that they did in the 80s, like Captain America and the Hulk, all, those, all these are kind of very jokey TV shows. None of the movies ever like translated except for the Superman movies in the 70s. And then those went into parody and camp and horror mm -hmm. with like the quest for peace and nuclear boy and all that stuff. So, you know, better left not talk about that. But that was 87 and Batman came out in 89. So you have to remember Superman for the quest for peace actually came out two years before Batman. A horrible, goofy, campy piece mm -hmm. of crap. Then followed by something that was like, not only is it taking the, the idea of a dude turning into a bat and fighting a crazy weird guy with a, a joker face, a clown, a murdering clown, <coughs> making everybody into it. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, I was already into it, and then I got really excited when they cast Michael Keaton, because I, I, I believed in the same thing. It's like, I don't need to see a six foot four giant hulking dude play Batman. Granted, that's like the comic book iteration of it, but in reality, it would take a guy like with a lot of weapons and technology and to dress up like a bat, you'd have to have some mental problems. Mm -hmm. so, otherwise, you'd just be in a tank and blowing people away with like laser scopes. You wouldn't have like a weird, I'm Batman, like a suit and all this other stuff. So he obviously, by casting someone like Keaton, who did an incredible job in Night Shift, he just had this manic energy. Beetlejuice was the proving ground. You had a bunch of sweaty nerds like, I can't know, it's, he's a short guy and he's a comedian, Beetlejuice is Batman, but luckily the internet didn't exist yet because it, <laughs> it wouldn't have been Batman. That's what my argument with Nicolas Cage and Superman, if the internet existed with Batman in 88, you wouldn't, you, he would have been recast. It would have been a fire Burton, a Pee Wee's mm. Playhouse guy, get rid of him, get rid of Keaton, get Schwarzenegger in for Batman, and get, you know, it would have just been I'm a different the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Batman. Yeah, I'm Batman. Get to the yeah. Batmobile if you want to leave. Yeah. The Joker is still killing people. <laughs> I'll be back and smashing him. Horrible. Person. Sorry. Sorry, Christian Harloff, you should be doing this. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I think the first Batman, I have, I have some problems with it. it had two, why does every Batman villain in all the movies always have to run for mayor? And it started with Batman. Man. Then you had Penguin had to be mayor and they did Joker. So anyway, um, and there were some comedy moments. The quirky Prince music just didn't work for me. I would have loved it. It was just Danny Elfman from beginning to mm -hmm. end. True. I don't need Prince. I like Prince. Little Red Corvette, not in Batman. So let's just <laughs> leave it at that. Um, but yeah, Tim Burton did an incredible job. You mentioned Anton first. The entire production design team, everybody oh, involved heaven. just killed it and brought this, this level of you're in a world, you're immersed in this dark world of Gotham City, which never existed before, before Tim Burton's Batman. Tim Burton's Batman made Batman all black. That's before Nolan. 
It was like, hey, I'm gonna take this outfit, weird gray with a yellow symbol. And, and the like, underpants. Yeah, I'm like doing the bat with TZ, what's up? You know, that all of a sudden, now I'm a bat, I'm black. I, I have this symbol as a target, you taking that from Frank Miller. So it introduced a lot of these dark themes. Watching it now, it definitely has comical moments and a little bit of like, it could have been Batman and the Joker, the Joker's in it so much, but yeah. Jack Nicholson as the Joker, no one else could have even imagined anyone else. Back then it was like, wow, I wish they'd get Jack Nicholson to play that Joker, that'd be awesome. What, they cast him? Mm -hmm. It was like a fan's freak mm -hmm. out wet dream. They couldn't believe it. I was like, what, that's gonna be perfect. And he killed it. He was great as a Joker. Watching it again, I recently got to see it at the Arclight out here in Hollywood. So fun. Big screen with a packed house. It was so much fun. It was great to see it again. And I it mean, holds up. It holds up. It, there's a mm -hmm. few Vicky Vale screams just four <laughs> times too many, piercing the ear and wanting to see the character murdered. There's a few, <laughs> few problems with the mayor and the dance sequences, and a couple of the action sequences were just kind of rushed, where he's like, here, I'll do this with a hand and a weird frying pan thing will come out. <laughs> the, what? So a few questionable moments, but overall, incredible film. I like what you said about Batman Returns. He got full creative control and did a really dark opera. The only problem so, with that, getting full creative control, he was like, Catwoman, she can be resuscitated by cats. And that's yeah. such a Burton thing to do. And it's like, but that's not what she is. What are you doing to right. Selena Kyle? Right. Um, and then the penguin, that wasn't the actual penguin. It was something that he imagined in high sure. school. And he was like, but I've got full creative control. But I don't mind that. I don't mind the iterations of, a, of an auteur taking a, a molded, you know, because then, look, you'll have Penguin later. Now you have Gotham with the yeah. Penguin, and now he's like a mob boss. But it's super and that, that's a great thing about Batman is that no one right. really had superpowers. Right. They had disfigurations, they had terrible accidents, but they never had powers. So having nine lives all of a sudden and dying and coming back, I'm like, mm -hmm. right. But adding it's a, Michelle Pfeiffer. She was great. <laughs> I actually do prefer Michelle Pfeiffer as Selena Kyle than Anne Hathaway. I was one of those people that when Anne Hathaway was announced, I was like, why? No, she's not feline-esque. She's not badass. And I, you know, you were saying that you were sold. I when actually it. liked it when she was first cast. I didn't like it either. Um, I was just like, really? You're getting, you know, princess, whatever, diaries, diaries yeah. woman in this. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wow, she killed it. Yeah, she I liked absolutely her a lot. Really I thought she captured. was the best part of the Dark Knight yeah. Rises, to be honest well, with you. Well, here, I this thought is she was the perfect be transition well. into the Nolan side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go around the table again and talk about why we think Nolan is perhaps the more influential. Why don't we start with you this time, Mom? Um, Nolan really nailed the origin story. So Batman, you know, from going from the boy who lost his parents to this crime-fighting machine, it's like, well, how? And it doesn't take, you know, a wake up going, well, I think I'm gonna change my life today. It takes training, it takes having a mentor, it takes this whole, you know, half the movie journey to get from A to B, and that's what Nolan cherished, and I think he did a really good job. Um, instead of it being more about, you know, the glam and the Gotham and the Gothic and, you know, that, that operatic style, it was more about substance. It was about, you know, the hard-earned content and you know who Batman is and I really respect and appreciate that um, I also liked uh, just that he again put a twist on it he put his own spin on it it wasn't hyped up it was this thing where you know the joke is supposed to have perma white skin and he went no nah, we're gonna put face paint and you're like okay <laughs> and it worked and it was great Heath Ledger hands down best part of uh, the Dark Knight like mm. like that to me if you didn't want to cry and um, didn't have like sort of just goosebumps everywhere every time he spoke, then something's wrong with her. Um, there's another part, Commissioner Gordon! Commissioner Gordon was so much better in the Nolan trilogies because they utilised his character, yeah. he, you know, he served a purpose. Gary Oldman, I'm biased because he married my second cousin, so technically we're family, but <laughs> that aside, <laughs> that aside, I thought that he was really, really perfect, nailed that role and uh, unfortunately, was it Pat Hingle? Uh, yes, yeah. you sweaty girl nerd. <laughs> so no one else would ever know that Pat Hingle played Commissioner Gordon. Well, they, there you go. But they used, <laughs> like, why she's here. In the animated series, Commissioner Gordon is the older man that's larger built like Pat Hingle. But, you know, I think that they evolved Commissioner Gordon and that. Uh, they used Go Joseph Gordon Levitt in it. And I thought that they were going to mold him to be Nightwing. And there's such a great opportunity there that they didn't use. And I'll get over it one day. That's fine. <laughs> um, and I'm, a, yeah, I think that's kind of me, Noland out. Oh, um, the Batman, though. Uh, I prefer Christian Bale as Bruce Wayne. Because it's not talking like Cookie Monster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in for a film like that. Yeah, Nolan, 
If you compared the films, it's really hard to do because they really just offer a completely different approach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Nolan's is very Nolan's, Burton's is very Burton's, and I think they have established their styles and energies in applying them to all the films they touch. They both have a very distinctive style. Um, Nolan, I think, made it even more grounded than, you know, I said that the other film kind of brought in non-comic book fans as well because the universe was just so fun and it was just so full of life and energy. But this really just was an incredible film series and very much told through the lens of Nolan. And the cinematography mm. is just the shots, the long, I mean, you brought up Dark Knight, like that first scene where the Joker was introduced oh. and, you know, the bank, like, it's just, it's art. This These film series are art to me. And the way that... The characters were kind of definitely told in, you know, a different way. And that's what I appreciate about both filmmakers. They put their own unique spin on it. And I'm with you. I'm okay if you kind of tweak it to the film universe you're creating as long as you get the main traits that we want to see. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about Anne Hathaway a little bit. What Nolan did with that character actually gave her depth that I thought was missing in Michelle Pfeiffer. As much as I adore her, I thought she was just too much like yeah. this and blah, you know, and like, I just, yeah, I thought that was fantastic. And one thing that I think Nolan really showed as well is just how tormented of a soul Batman is. You know, he watched his parents be murdered, which pretty much shaped the rest of his life. And sure, he was born as Bruce Wayne, and we know that he becomes the Batman, which is more his true self, and he steps into that power. But I really think it showed the dilemma and the isolation and the pain and not, not really the finding... intellect, though. He really missed, I feel, Nolan missed um, Batman's intellect and his just incredible detective skills. Yeah, and his that was smarts. Like, he was on it. Like, yes. Batman knew... She I, excuse me. Huh. Well, they, um, they they took a they took a they gave him a Lucius Fox. So by giving is, him Lucius yeah. Fox, they take away some of his detective yeah. skills. Mm. So they give the Batman gadgetry. He's supposed to be the great the world's greatest detective. Yeah. They never said he's like a superhero. He doesn't yeah. have superpowers. And by taking that away, I, I, I'm jumping my turn. Yeah. Sorry. Well, we're all talking, guys. We're talking. Um, <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah. So I mean, I think that kind of takes uh, diminishes it a little bit. I think yeah, he went on his journey. He he got you know he learned how to fight. Mm -hmm. But by getting Lucius Fox to be like, I'm the tech guy, it kind of also reduced his like skill level set. Where in Tim Burton's Batman, they always showed Michael Keaton's Bruce Wayne like at the computer, he logging things in, researching, mm. trying to get files, having Alfred help him out with mm -hmm. like, get me this, let's go shopping, let's go do this, let's go and do some detective work. Didn't really see that with Batman in any of the. He had people movies. doing it all for him. Yeah. yeah, and that makes more sense if he's got that much money. Right. But that's not who Batman. But was. what do you think Nolan did better? Let's see. Nolan did an incredible job because number one, Nolan had to re-breathe a fresh pair of life <laughs> back into a franchise that got pounded down by Schumacher Land. So <laughs> that was CP. Yeah, it was like definitely. <laughs> oh, it's dead, buried. It's not six feet under. It's underneath like 400 levels of cement that's frozen. Mm. There's steel you have to chisel through. Um, look, everyone knows Batman and Robin sucked. And I get it. A couple of you guys are going to be getting all sweaty. Like, nah, I love Batman and Robin. I don't care, <laughs> is my opinion. So it's a horrible film. <laughs> uh, break out your bat credit card and go shove it. Uh, <laughs> It's, it, it, for me, when I saw it, I almost was a, a broken man leaving the theater. It was like, how did it go from super cool Tim Burton's Batman? I thought we'd be getting more closer to the, you know, Frank Miller's Dark Knight. Now it's like campy. It wasn't an adult movie, though. It was for the kids, and this was my age. So I grew up on the, you know, the Batman and forever. Right, and a lot of people love Batman and Robin who were kids, and I don't have any problem with that. I, I've talked to people a who are like... A frizz is coming. Like, yeah. we finally got our Arnie that we were all that wasn't, that wasn't bad. Oh, chill. <laughs> But see, but see, that's the flip frozen, side of the yeah. merchandising thing that, that Tim Burton opened up. And then now you have with Batman and Robin, it's like, okay, well, let's make this for the kids. Yeah. Let's have all this stuff. Let's have uh, Robin. Let's have Batgirl. Batgirl. Yeah. Let's You're have a compost. bunch of it. So yeah. they can sell all the toys. Get them on ice, oh, skating no. around. There's some action figures. Nobody bought those figures. Those are the biggest action figure bomb ever. And the funny thing about the first Batman movie with Tim Burton, that's when I was like, where are the action figures? There was like, Two really horrible, like Galoob style, like weird, like <laughs> I'm Batman, like weird figures that weren't posable, and then Bob. Remember the yeah. the Joker's friend, Bob? He was. I, I was like, I'm not buying these. They're horrible. <laughs> so anyway, like it opened up the door to making a ton of Batman yeah. merchandise, which mm. is 
Now there's Bat there's a million Batman. But what Schumacher so. did do is deliver us these, you know, abhorrent one liners that we can throw down. Like I actually really like that. You'll Carey, never forget. That you will never forget. <laughs> like riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's <laughs> afraid of the big black bat? Like I love right. that. Those are nightmare but inducing. For them. For them. <laughs> for them. Tommy Lee Jones, two face. <laughs> can't even understand what it's an actor. Why can't I Bane. understand? Bane! Oh, saying? because we can all understand Tom Hardy's Bane. No, we're talking about uh, Schumacher's Bane. <laughs> oh, we're no, yeah. we don't talk about shit. What's that? that what's going People on forget that? that Bane was Bane even was in Bane was in Batman or Robin. Yeah. He's just a weird, veiny thing. Yeah. So like, would inflate. Dennis, what do you have to add about <laughs> the, the Nolan pro? Well, um, what Schnepp was talking about, yeah, the Batman franchise, it wasn't dead, but it was like in a coma. Yeah. So yeah. Chris Nolan brought that out with, with Batman Begins, and then he killed it with the Dark Knight. And so on the flip side of of instead of the studios respecting the comic book genre, what Nolan did was he got like kind of more of the creatives in terms of like big actors mm -hmm. and other directors to be like, oh wow, especially with The Dark Knight. I mean, with Batman Begins, it was a good, um, I think it was a really good movie, but then I think The Dark Knight is a great movie. Yes. And that, that movie made it like, okay, this movie needs to be seen by everyone, not just people who are comic book fans. It's basically a crime movie yeah. with weirdo superheroes exactly. involved. There's yeah. a guy with face paint, he's a terrorist, here's a dude dressed as a bat because somebody killed his parents, mm. and Chuck in Two-Face. Exactly, know? and so that, I think what he did was he, he brought that seriousness, the realisticness to that, to the genre that opened up, so people that of like more, um, I guess, less open-minded actors are more willing now. I mean, you have like a Robert Redford now in, in Captain America 2, and you have, mm -hmm. right. did you ever think that would happen? No. Nope. I mean, never. No. Nope. Yeah. Like, we were like, you know, oh, okay, man, we were just hoping, I remember just watching crap, like, in the late 80s, early 90s, just watching a lot of, like, crappy stuff just because it was comic book related, Dolph even Lundgren though they as sucked. the Punisher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and, and Tim Burton's movie was really good. It, it, influenced some movies at that time, but I think it has less influence now. It had that theatricality mm -hmm. that like, um, you know, if you guys watch the, the Crow or Dark City, like that kind of had that style, but in today's world, a lot more of the-, the all borrowing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and, and now, the more of the comic book movies of today are influenced by uh, Chris Nolan's film. Especially DC. I mean, yeah. look at their track record. That has been, to date, the most successful franchise, mm -hmm. and that's now the tone. Even Man of Steel felt more grounded. And before that, it was a lot more theatrical Flamboyant. in terms of- comic Exactly. Yeah. And that's Burton's world, and that worked for his world. Kind of like you're saying, the Riddler in that film, that worked for the, you know, the world that they created. There. There, yeah. But I still want the darker, more demented Riller also to make you know a reprise. Mm. But yeah, I think he kind of set that town, and he also gave dimension to the villains, yeah. which I think was very, very much lacking in the Burton films. They, they, I still felt like they were twirling the mustaches, even though I loved Danny DeVito as Penguin, and I loved all of the characters he introduced. I feel like. The Joker, and even Bane. I mean, I just feel like that backstory they did show. I know he was kind of a wasted character in the end. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Talia, they, they really did show dimension. Wasted character, so, throw him in a corner, that's it. <laughs> what? Yeah. That's kind of. Yeah, really, though. But when you kind of look at, you know, even like League of Shadows and everything that they introduced, like I just feel like they gave more context and more dimension to the evil forces that, you know, were tormenting yeah. them. They had the whys, not just the whats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we kind of run down a couple of tangents along the way, the way I like it. So uh, last final two cents, why don't we start with you, Schnepp? Um, give me who you think wins in this debate of who's more influential in the end. I'd say who's more influential in the end right now. I'd have to go with uh, Michael Keaton's Batman. I'd have to go with Tim Burton's Batman. I'd have to say both of those characters. Like the uh, Christian Bale Batman, I would agree with you. He's like tied for Bruce Wayne characterization in the films. I just don't, I think the, unfortunately, my opinion of The Dark Knight Rises, it was phoned in. I thought nobody cared anymore. I didn't think the story worked. I thought it was rushed, had time jumps, weird problems, like five months, eight years, this, that. Uh, the villains didn't work. They brought back the League of Shadows, but ruined it for me because I love the setup with Ross Al Ghul and the League of Shadows. I love Batman Begins. I absolutely, fanatically love The Dark Knight as a film, as a Batman movie. It's fantastic. Super disappointed with The Dark Knight Rises. Um, like I said earlier, I thought Catwoman was originally like, oh my God, they're ruining it. They're st why put Catwoman in it? Then she was my, my favorite part because at least it had a little bit of lightness and, and fun instead of the, where is Bane? <laughs> you know, like I just didn't like the characterization anymore. It, everything about it just went 
into the poop land for me for mm -hmm. Dark Knight Rises. So unfortunately, with that ending, with that, I definitely everyone took that and jumped off of it, like the grittier, darker superhero thing. Ba uh, Batman Begins helped jumpstart that, but if you go back to it, what really started everything that we're all seeing now is Tim Burton's Batman. That was the genesis of 1989, gigantic, massive hit. Showed all of the producers, all of the companies, you can make a lot of money with the superhero genre. Let's start, let's start mass producing superhero movies. Look at like a few years later, you know, you have, you have a, uh, you know, um, what was, what was next right after Batman? It's like in the 90s we had, I mean, X-Men was like 1999. Like I'm spacing out what happened right after Batman. There's a few years. I think the, the crow <laughs> was a few counts. years later. Yeah, or, you know, you had Dark City. You had uh, it, it still took a little while. For, yeah, you had Batman Returns. People were still pretty tentative with it. So, but I'd have to look at that as the one that like jump started the whole superhero game. You had Blade, really, literally, mm -hmm. like a kind of a big jump from Batman Returns to Blade, like five or six years mm -hmm. before the Marvel characters. They were bankrupt. Yeah. Back in the 80s, they're like selling them off piecemeal. That's why we have all, they're all separate yeah. separate now because they're like, we don't even know what we're going to do. DC almost bought Marvel. That's how wow. weird stuff happens. So in the 90s, everything was in flux. But I have to look, I, I always look at, uh, you know, Tim Burton's Batman as the one that started this whole thing that we're in now, like literally, what is it, 25 years later. So. Dennis? Um, yeah, they're both really influential, but I'm going to go with Chris Nolan's. Uh, series just because it, it affects more of the modern comic book movies of today and Tim Burton's definitely opened that door but with with Chris Nolan's films yeah he, he just the legion of fan base that he has now for 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 the Batman trilogy and and Dark Knight Rises I still liked it but there was definitely some issues with it but everyone loves all those movies and I think a lot of the ones that are from today are just influenced more by that you know and uh, I don't know. I, I, despite uh, Christian Bale's, where is she, Batman? Like, I, I'm, I still, I, I still like it. Uh, influence wise, um, you, you know, I think we've really established the fact that Burton opened the door. You know, mm -hmm. he set the pavement, you know, and then Nolan used that as a canvas to draw over it. Um, I feel that. Influential wise, I mean, even success wise, Nolan's films were more successful. Yes, there were three compared to two, um, but box office wise, they did better. And now, look at the next sort of five years that we have in film. It's going to be comic book movie, and they are all going to refer to Nolan and what he's done. So, as far as influence is concerned, and he's bringing up the next generation, you know, the people that are born in the 90s and the noughties, that's their Batman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to be influenced by Nolan and maybe they want to be a film writer or a director or, you know, get into this. And that he's just like, you know, kind of setting up the next g g um, generation and, you know, of, of the whole comic book movie genre. So I think it's going to be Nolan. He's just got more people out there that are looking at him at the moment. Whereas, I'm going hmm. to side with Nolan as well. Um, what Burton did for just bringing interest to this world and to comic book films in general is undeniable. I mean, he really did, I think you pegged it perfectly, he opened the door and he started getting the talent and just elevated these films, but I feel like Nolan brought a mature artistic eye to it and kind of separated it just from being this hokey kind of fun world into just being kind of just masterpieces of film. And I feel like at that point, the game kind of changed. And it's like, wow, maybe consumers are smart and they want these films to feel grounded and to feel like, you know, it's this part, this world that they could actually be a part of and not like, you know, on a different planet. So mm -hmm. I definitely think that people are mimicking his style a little more. And those are the, the films I want to see. I loved Burton's films for what they did mm -hmm. and for how they opened the door. And I do think they still stand up. I've definitely rewatched the 1989 Batman pretty recently and I was like this is fun but Nolan's films are just that to me is just it's raising the bar again and it's just showing what's possible um, where we're at I would be very interested to see Burton tackle another film now with the technology that's available because right, like, um, I think that yeah. would be really cool because for what he did um, at the time was he almost pretty got phenomenal. the chance with Superman Lives I mean yeah. that's literally when uh, graphics I mean they were, if you look at it like they were making the Phantom Menace so CG had already hit this new plateau mm -hmm. where we, you know, we didn't see anything up until that point that had superheroes like fighting people who are intergalactic planets and things like that. And that's kind of what would have happened. I mean, I look at like in history, a lot of a lot of people need to remember like 
There wasn't, there was Batman, Adam West. Some people don't even know who Adam West is. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're like, who's that? It's like, uh, we're not talking about Kanye West, it's Adam West, <laughs> Batman. Yeah, so let's not talk Kanye. People, I mean, especially nerds, you gotta get your history down and learn about things that happened. Just because you were born in the 90s doesn't mean the 80s or the 70s, the 50s or the 40s didn't happen. Learn your history. Bam. Boom. All right, guys, that will do it for this AMC Versus. Thank you so much for joining us for this fun topic, Nolan versus Burton. But as we always say, you know, it matters what we say, but we want to hear what you think as well. Make sure to check the show notes and vote who you think was more influential for comic book films, Nolan versus Burton. All right, guys, I'd like to thank my wonderful panelists for today. Starting to my left, writer-director John Schnapp. Hey. Where can people find you? You guys find me at Twitter and Instagram, just, uh, you know, at John Schnapp. And uh, go to schnappzone.com slash Superman Lives. Donate, get your name in the credits of Superman Lives documentary that I'm working on. It's the Tim Burton movie that you didn't get to see. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> the wonderful Maud Garrett. Where can people find you online? Um, if you're on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Maud Garrett. And I'm also on Facebook plus Geek Bomb. You can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube too. And geekbomb.net. Our wonderful producer, Dennis Sen. Where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter, at Pink Hero, and on uh, YouTube, Pink Hero Pro. Great, and I'm Amy Rose with AMC Movie News. You can find me at Amy Rosie, the various social networks. Thanks again for joining us, and vote. Very curious to see how this one is going to pan out. So thanks again for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, everyone. If you like this video, click that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It's free and helps you stay up to date with all the latest movie news, as well as our daily AMC Movie Talk Show. Also, make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with all of our special promotions, contests, and prize giveaways.